now you can stop murmuring, having spoken with the sound guy. Um, <clears throat> let me say, by virtue of introduction, first off, thank you all very much for coming today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Dickey Center for International Understanding and the War and Peace Group at Dartmouth College here for sponsoring this event. What we're going to do this year as part of our speaker series is present a trio of discussions such as this one on what we in the War and Peace Group and the Dickey Center in general think are some of the key foreign policy issues that the United States faces today. We're going to begin with a discussion about some of the ways in which the United States is prosecuting what is referred to commonly as the War on Terror. In the winter term, we're going to bring a couple of speakers out to talk to you about the nature of Islamic extremist violence. Um, we have an agreement already with Professor Robert Pape from the University of Chicago, who has a book out recently called Dying to Win, um, and we'll have some as a foil for him. And then in the spring, we're going to bring two people out to talk to you about the nature of big oil. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of the problems that have led to the discussions here and continued on for the last few years have been driven by the policies of the last 50 years that have developed to essentially address America's insatiable thirst for cheap energy. And so we're going to close our series this, this spring with a discussion about whether or not we've actually hit the end of a really good run when it comes to exploiting cheap energy sources. The motive for today's discussion, uh, for me, goes back to a moment earlier this summer. I was in Israel on a sort of professional development trip to learn about why and how Israel prosecutes what it sees as its unilateral war on terrorism. And I was there for 10 days. We had six or seven meetings a day with people in the military, with activists, academics, government people. And one of our meetings was with the American ambassador to Israel. And he talked to us for about a half an hour, and then he opened it up so we could ask him questions. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Ambassador, what is America's view on Israel's policy of course of interrogations and targeted killings? And he said, trying to put a little light on the matter, he said, well, I guess we're going to get right down to the hard questions, aren't we? And this long period of silence. And he said, well, until a very few years ago, the United States position, both publicly and privately, was that we were extraordinarily critical of the Israelis. Today, our policy is the Israeli policy. Now, I had kind of had a sense that was true, but I was astonished that this gentleman would say it so boldly and plainly. <clears throat> Today, I think that it is a great privilege for us to have both one of the gentlemen responsible for the drafting of components of that policy as well as one of the more eloquent and strident critics of the administration's policies. What we're going to do today is have Professor Yu on my left and uh, Mr. Horton on my right, <clears throat> each of whom will speak for 20 minutes. They will lay out, in obviously in just a short number of minutes, their view. At the end of that, each of them will then have five minutes for comment on what the other has said. At that point, we're going to turn the floor over to you, and I will then serve as a moderator for questions from the floor. So I'd like to begin with introducing Professor John Yu. Professor Yu is a professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley, and the Bolt Hall School of Law. Prior to being a law professor there, he served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the United States government. In that capacity, he wrote, numerous memos and opinions that serve as the basis of American policy today in the war on terror. Professor Yu. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan, uh, for that in introduction. I'd like to thank the uh, uh, Dickey Center for, uh, and Dartmouth College for inviting me to uh, speak before you. Um, I welcome any chance I have to get out of the People's Republic of Berkeley and visit uh, more conservative cities uh, like Hanover. Although my two professorial escorts who got me by the protesters warned me 
that Hanover is not as conservative as I've been led to believe in popular culture. And one of the reasons I thought that is I, and one of the reasons I uh, accept the invitation is that I clerked for uh, one of your uh, proud graduates, uh, Judge Lawrence Silberman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, who was the head of the Iraqi WMD Commission that issued, issued its report uh, in the spring. And uh, he always, always reminded me every day that I worked for him that one of the great shortcomings in my education is that I did not go to Dartmouth. <laughs> so I decided I'd have to come and see for myself. Uh, the other reason I'm here is uh, I've come to plug my book. So there it is, I've plugged it. Um, but the only, if, if there are things uh, that I say today, there's a lot more things I say in the book that serve as a broader explanation for some of the arguments I'll make today. So if you're curious about it, go buy the book off Amazon, uh, increase the sales figures, and then return it when you're done. Get your money back. I'm very happy if you do that too. Uh, the last thing I want to say before I start the substance of remarks is I'm not going to, um, A, represent the views of the United States government. I don't do that anymore. Um, uh, often when you speak for the government, you had to say the views that I represent today do not represent the views of the government, and that's certainly true today. I'm also not here to talk or debate about the Patriot Act, which I also worked on, which I think, which I take is not a subject for the debate, although if it comes up in the questions, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, and the last subject is I'm, I'm not going to try to get too much in the legal details because I know you all are mostly undergraduates or faculty. Um, I, um, I see you are blessed not to have a law school. I'm sure you've thought about it. Uh, it is much cheaper just to invite law professors to come speak periodically than to actually have a law school on your campus. And having a law school can sometimes prove quite damaging to academic inquiry. So let me uh, start with, uh, let me just start now. Um, I think the fundamental difference between uh, critics of the administration and those who uh, support taking a more aggressive stand is characterizing, and it really is a legal question, is characterizing what the September 11th attacks were and what we are engaged in now with the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. And I think it boils down to a simple question about whether this is a war and whether the September 11th attacks were a war or whether they were a crime. And let me say this is not a partisan issue. Before September 11th, up to September 10th, 2001, uh, political parties running both administration and Congress for many decades took the view that terrorism was primarily a criminal justice problem. Right, so if you remember the embassy attacks or you remember the attack on the USS Cole, what did we do as a country? We would send out the FBI to secure and investigate a crime scene and then we would send agents out to arrest people and bring them back to the United States for trial and we tried people for those attacks. It's a very criminal justice way of looking at the problem of terrorism. And what I'm gonna argue uh, and put to you, because I, I, I freely admit that this is a question that's open, is, is, is one that we as a country have to decide, is whether the September 11th attacks initiated a war and whether they were an active war. Because if they are an active war, then things like, uh, as Alan was talking about, targeted killings, as they call it in Israel, become legal. They are definitely not something you can do uh, in the, within the criminal justice system. But if we are moving to a model of war against the Al-Qaeda terrorist network, then there are things which the legal system permits us to do, which we would not be able to do if we were just providing, if we were just pursuing a criminal justice matter. So first, let me explain why I think the September 11th attacks were uh, the start of a war. Um, first, look at the source of the attacks. They were an attack by a foreign entity. Right, what was their purpose? They had a political purpose in mind, right, to change our policy in the Middle East. And Al-Qaeda has an even broader goal of regime change throughout the Middle East to try to install fundamentalist Islamic regimes in place of the regimes that are there now. <coughs> Look at the level of violence, right? 3,000 lives lost, billions of dollars in damage, a shutdown of our financial and transportation systems in the country for over a week, um, an attempt to decapitate the American government by striking the White House or Congress and striking New York City. All of those, I would put to you, are uh, factors which indicate that the September 11th attacks were an act of war. Uh, put it differently, and ask a question. If a nation state had carried out the September 11th attacks in exactly the same way, right? If the Soviet Union during the Cold War had carried out the September 11th attacks in the same way with the same kind of personnel, would we have any doubt that that was the start of a war, that was an act of war, and that we would be in a war with the Soviet Union? 
i think the only thing that is different and causes the discussions and i would say confusion that we have in our society is that the tax were carried out by a non state actor by a non nation state by the al qaeda terrorist network and because of that we are used to as a society dealing with entities like that using the criminal justice system we're used to using the tools of law enforcement against organized crime or against drug cartels, for example. And I think it's that confusion which causes the debates we're having now about whether detainees should get lawyers, whether detainees should be allowed to have criminal trials before juries rather than being detained uh, for long periods of time till the war is over. So what's the difference between um, crime and war? I think there, there, there are uh, s uh, two really uh, important differences. Uh, sort of as a thematic level. Thematically, one is crime, if you think about it, is primarily a retrospective endeavor, right? We as a society have decided to allow criminal attacks, criminal harms to occur. You know, we don't try to preemptively stop them in the way you do in the military world. So, for example, you remember the movie Minority Report, such a shocking thing because we were using law enforcement to try to stop crimes before they happened. Right, the criminal justice system, in fact, is one that is retrospective in nature. The crime occurs, and then we use the resources of law enforcement and the courts to try to historically piece together what happened and hold people responsible for the crime they committed. Right, the military system, and if we're in a, if we're in a state of war, the primary goal is not retrospective. It's not about punishing people. It is about preventing future attacks from occurring on the United States. It is prospective in nature. And that really, uh, I think, sharp uh, explains the difference between things like targeted killings, between uh, with detention, interrogation, and so on. I think, and, and I think, I hope to explain why that is. And the one thing I'd put to you is just as a policy question before getting into the specific issues, is should we give, or I'm sorry, what incentives are we creating by treating Al Qaeda or other similar terrorist organizations that attack the United States? by treating them within the criminal justice system, by treating them uh, with the benefits such as lawyers, trials, charges, and so on, that apply to normal criminals, when if we were fighting a nation state that carried out the September 11th tax in exactly the same way, we would be applying a system that is much tougher on them, right? that does not charge people when they're detained, that allows detention to occur for long periods of time before a war is over, that does allow for preemptive attacks on members of the enemy, when that is barred by the criminal justice system. And let me say again, this is a perfect example, now I'm gonna talk about the targeted killings issue. Uh, this, is, uh, this really was the way we thought about it before September 11th. So there were, if you look at the 9-11 Commission report, there were two opportunities for the Clinton administration to target and kill Osama bin Laden. And on one of those occasions, uh, the National Security Advisor d uh, vetoed the plan and explained later that he didn't think there was enough proof to bring to a federal district judge that Osama bin Laden was actually linked and responsible for some of the pre-9-11 style attacks. Right? It's a very criminal, law, criminal justice law enforcement way of looking at a certain problem. But now, let me say, if we are in a state of war, then I think you can do things like targeted killings. Right? In wartime, it is legal to kill members of the enemy. Right? Murder is certainly barred if we're in peacetime, and in criminal justice, if we're in a criminal justice slash peacetime world, then I would say we are, it is illegal for us to attack preemptively members of Al-Qaeda unless they were imminently about to harm and kill an individual. That's the normal law enforcement standard that a police officer would obey. But if we're at war, then we can launch attacks to try to kill members of Al-Qaeda and their leaders um, wherever they may be located. And I think there may be hard, there are difficult questions, certainly, about the amount of information you should have before you try to attack somebody. But I don't think legally it is prohibited. Certainly in wartime, we have tried to kill the heads of other states. And we have certainly tried to kill directly uh, generals and other top leaders. Just a historical example, in World War II, uh, the United States successfully found out about the travel plans of uh, Admiral Yamamoto and sent a force out and shot his plane down and killed him. And that was targeted killing because it is legal in wartime to kill members of the enemy and in fact to kill members of the leadership of the enemy who have control over the armed forces. I think any other issues about who, how you do it, when you do it, how much evidence you need and so on are questions of policy that you know, sensible leaders ought to weigh and think about but legally I think is an option that's open.
Second, let me talk a little bit about the status of the detainees that are captured in the war on terrorism, because I also think there's confusion about what laws apply or don't apply. So even if we're in warfare with members, uh, with Al-Qaeda, I would say there's two kinds of legal status that people who are captured can hold. If you're covered by the Geneva Conventions, then you can be detained as a POW, as a prisoner of war, which is a very specific and distinct legal category um, under uh, the Geneva Conventions. However, the Geneva Conventions don't apply in all situations. The Geneva Conventions are a treaty. They are an agreement between nation states that have signed them. The very beginning of the Geneva Conventions say the provisions only apply between what it calls the high contracting parties, the people who the nations have actually signed the conventions. Right? People who fight for al-Qaeda and the entity itself have not signed the Geneva Conventions. They are not entitled to the benefits of a treaty which they have never agreed to live up to. And in fact, uh, to, just to press a little farther, the Geneva Conventions even have a specific uh, provision in them that say, even if you're fighting, if, if you're fighting someone who's not signed the Geneva Conventions, then you can, uh, that country can still voluntarily declare at the beginning of a war that it will follow the Geneva Conventions, and if they do, you have an obligation to follow them too. I ask, is Al-Qaeda done? Anything like that? Have they declared that they would follow the Geneva Conventions? Do we know, if, if from everything we know, does it appear that they even take prisoners? No, in fact, they don't seem to take prisoners and they seek to take hostages and execute them. They, do they follow the laws of war? No, I would say they don't. In fact, the way they operate by its very method violates the core norm of the laws of war developed over thousands of years, which is to spare innocent civilian life. Think about how Al-Qaeda operates. First, they try to disguise themselves as civilians to blur the lines between civilians and combatants, and then they target, specifically target civilians, civilians who have no military uh, value or not performing military functions, right? The whole point of laws of war is to make sure that combatants and civilians distinguish themselves so that people don't kill civilians by mistake and to have an absolute bar on the killing of innocent civilians. And I ask you, does Al-Qaeda follow those rules? It doesn't seem to me that they do. And if they don't, then it seems to me the United States has no legal obligation to follow the Geneva Conventions and the conflict with Al-Qaeda. Right? It's just simply there is no agreement. There's no other party that has agreed to obey the Geneva Conventions. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't, as a matter of policy, decide to extend prisoner of war protections to them if people think that's the right thing to do. But that's not a choice that is legally taken away from our uh, national leaders in deciding how to deal with the members of al-Qaeda. Now let me turn to interrogation. If um, this is a war, well first of all, if this was a crime, if 9-11 were a crime, then interrogation would be of the kind we all know from popular culture, from the popular media, right? From shows like Law and Order, which I'm sure is playing on three channels simultaneously right now while I'm speaking. But we all know it. You have right to Miranda, you have warnings that are read to you, you have right to a lawyer, right to remain silent, right to a jury trial. At that jury trial, you can force the government to produce all exculpatory information about you. You have a right to compel witnesses to show up on your behalf. You have a right to conviction by the jury, and then, only then, can you be incarcerated. Right. The Miranda standard does not apply in wartime. Right. Because, as I said, again, the purpose of detention in wartime is not to punish people, it's simply to detain them from returning to the fight and to allow for interrogation to get information of them of value. But it's not about punishment. That's why, even if the Geneva Convention is applied or not, there's no right to a lawyer and there's no right to a criminal trial on any detainee who's captured in wartime. Right? The old, think about World War II. The United States captured millions of prisoners. They were not all given lawyers. They were not all charged with crimes. They were not all brought back to the United States to appear in a courtroom. They were simply held in camps until the conflict was over. But getting to the interrogation issue again, um, one, the Geneva Conventions establish a, a tough standard about interrogation. But the interrogation standards in the Geneva Conventions don't apply to members of al-Qaeda, again, because they have not accepted the Geneva Convention standards. So the question is, what standards do apply? Well, the United States says and believes that torture is not permissible, but that coercive interrogation that falls short of torture is. And the question is, and I think it's a very difficult question, is what is the difference? Where is that line drawn? 
and we can have a debate and discussion about where that line should be drawn. I think that the United States has tried to clarify, clarify that line in a series of legal actions it's taken over the last 10 years, but let me put this to you. If the Geneva Convention standards were an, ap were an application and we captured leaders of al-Qaeda, which we have, we have captured the third, fourth, and fifth highest ranking members of al-Qaeda, the, the third one, Abu Zubaydah, who ha was in charge of operational plans on behalf of al-Qaeda. If the Geneva Conventions applied, the United States would be limited to questioning him solely at the worst by shouting questions at him and perhaps playing uh, tricks on him by saying, oh, I'm the good cop and no, I'm the bad cop and a lot of the routines you see in American police officers. You could not even offer, you cannot in the Geneva Conventions offer him any positive or negative benefits for cooperating with the United States. You could not even offer him a plea bargain. That would be illegal under the Geneva Conventions. So what could you do to him? I say you should be able to do more than just simply yell questions at him. Suppose the United States were to employ the standards that are used in basic training of our troops. You know, people are made to run long distances. They're made to you know, endure, you know, endure periods without sleep. They're, they have to live under tough conditions. I don't think that our uh, military leaders have been torturing our every basic uh, training recruit that we've had for decades and decades. I think there are things that people, that the uh, government can do, which is fall short of torture. And so I think the question is, what is it that we're comfortable allowing the government to do that goes beyond simple questioning, but then does not violate the ban on torture? Um, let me say, one, uh, my time's almost up because I used them up trying to make stupid jokes. But let me try to um, uh, close with just some, a way of thinking about this more broadly. Um, a law does play a purpose, and law, law plays a very useful and important purpose, say, don't kill, don't murder people, don't uh, drive over 75 or 85. It, may, it makes a lot of sense when we as a society have had some experience in dealing with some kind of social phenomenon. We have a sense of the costs and benefits of different policies, and we feel comfortable placing uh, strict rules on what the policy should be because we've already come to a vision or a conclusion about what our policymakers should do. And I'd ask, do you think, do we as a society feel comfortable trying to place those kind of strict rules and limits on uh, our members of the intelligence and armed forces in fighting what I think of as an unprecedented enemy in an unprecedented conflict, right? This is the first time we've ever fought a nation state that possesses the power of a nation state. The first time we've attacked, been attacked by an organization which carried out an attack that, in fact, is beyond the powers of many nation states on this planet right now. Right? And I think that poses difficult problems for us that have to do with targeted killings, that have to do with interrogation and detention and so on. And so I would ask, do we feel comfortable as a society that we already know all the costs and benefits of different policies, that we so are comfortable with the policies we ought to pursue, that we want to take certain options completely off the table for our policymakers to pursue when they are stuck in a war, which is very difficult to fight against an enemy that does not have cities and territories and populations to protect. And, in which, and one in which I think, and I feel our policymakers th think, we are not yet f sure about the kind of tactics and policies that will win. Thank you. For our next speaker, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Scott Horton. <coughs> Mr. Horton is a longtime practitioner in the field of international law. He is a partner in Patterson, Belknap, Webb, and Tyler, a firm with offices in both the United States and Europe. He's also an adjunct professor at the Columbia University Law School and chair of the New York, New York City Bar Association Committee on International Law. Mr. Horton? Thank you, Al. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Dartmouth uh, and the Dickey Center and the War and Peace uh, Studies Group uh, for having the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Uh, I think there are few issues that our nation faces that are of such gravity as this one. It's important, it's particularly important uh, for this emerging generation today. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and I apologize also for my raspy voice. I'm afraid I'm being taxed with a bit of a flu. I don't uh, conceptualize the issue the same way John Yu does. I don't see this as a uh, dichotomy or choice between a uh, criminal law paradigm uh, and a Geneva Conventions paradigm. I see it as something uh, much simpler than that, a question of whether uh, we as Americans are going to live according to our own law and our moral values, 
as they've been incorporated and well stated for hundreds of years and i see signs even today within our military of people who continue to live up to those values and keep them sacred i see an answer for our country and not in the rhetoric of dick cheney and al gonzales or john yoo but in a statement of ian fishback and i'll quote from a letter he wrote to john mccain which was published by the washington post just a few weeks ago i would rather die fighting than give up even the smallest part of the idea that is america fishback is an officer with the eighty second airborne until recently he was stationed at a forward base and Camp Mercury in Iraq. He's a West Point graduate. He's a recipient of two Bronze Stars for Valor in Combat. Uh, and uh, Ian Fishback says that one day in 2004, he was in the rec tent uh, where the big screen projection TV is always tuned to Fox News. Uh, and he saw Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Rumsfeld was saying that the Pentagon fully recognized that the Geneva Conventions applied in Iraq and that they were being faithfully followed. Well, in fact, Captain Fishback said he and his colleagues had a very clear sense that just the opposite had been decided in the Pentagon. He thought that something must be terribly wrong because, he had, because there were detainees being held at Camp Mercury he was witnessing every day how they were treated, and it certainly had nothing whatsoever to do with the Geneva Convention rules. Um, among the practices that were being used at Camp Mercury uh, were two. Uh, one involved uh, taking detainees uh, who were held in a tent where they could be used recreationally by uh, soldiers, uh, and instructing these detainees to perform calisthenics and exercises until they collapsed from exhaustion. Another involved uh, physically assaulting, beating the detainees, uh, in some cases using a baseball bat, many of the blows being directed to an area uh, between the legs where very few signs, visible signs, appeared from their use. Other practices that were being used at the base uh, included um, stacking bodies of detainees, breaking phosphorus light sticks open and pouring the contents on the detainees' faces to scar them, uh, and enforce nudity. Now, many of these techniques are things that we know sound familiar to us from uh, the notorious few rotten apples at Abu Ghraib. Uh, the photographs I think everyone here has seen, they have an iconic uh, quality. Uh, but after hearing Rumsfeld speak, Captain Fishback thought something must be amiss here. So he went up the chain of command to uh, his uh, company commander, to the division commander, ultimately even speaking with the Secretary of the Army, Frank Harvey, describing what he had seen and asking how it was possible that this could be done given the Geneva Conventions. Nothing happened. This occurred over a period of 17 months. Finally, when Captain Fishback said he was going to take his accounts to Senator McCain, uh, Senator Graham, Senator Frist, and others, an investigation was commenced, and he learned very quickly that he was the target of the investigation, together with two NCOs who had also witnessed these sites and had been prepared uh, to corroborate them. So uh, John Yu has given you a description of the theory of the Bush administration's practice. I've given you a, a description of the practice itself. We're not talking about a few rotten apples or 40 cases of abuse or a hundred, but many hundreds and perhaps thousands of cases of which Captain Fishback's tale is a very good example. So I want to contrast the regime that's been introduced by George W. with the first George W. George Washington, because before this country had a constitution, a Supreme Court, or a president, we had an army. That was our first institution. And that army had 
very clear rules about how to deal with detainees and the revolutionary war the question of treatment of detainees was a huge issue if any of you are historians of that war and have followed it and have read the newspapers and accounts from it you know it appeared continuously in September of 1775 31 Americans were taken prison a uh, prisoner at Bunker Hill all of them were killed by their British captors at the capitulation of Fort Washington in New York City today in September of 1776 2,607 Americans were taken prisoner. By 1778, all but 800 of them had died, most of them dying following uh, horrible cases of abuse, mistreatment, and torture by their British captors. Most of that occurred in the prison hulks that were kept in New York uh, Harbor. In February of 1777 at Drake's Farm in New Jersey, seven American soldiers who surrendered to the British were murdered, their brains being bashed in by musket butts. Now, American public opinion at this time craw cried out for retaliation against the British, but George Washington viewed things differently. And on Christmas Day of 1776, he finally had an opportunity to put his views uh, on the matter forward. In that battle at Trenton, uh, Hessian mercenaries were captured, and Washington directed, treat them with humanity. On no account are these men to suffer mistreatment or abuse of any kind. To the contrary, he said, they will receive the same food, medical attention, and housing that our own soldiers receive. He was also concerned by the fact that many of these soldiers were of a different uh, religious confession than the Americans who held them captive. And he ordered that pains must be taken to respect the religion of the captives. His words are these, while we are contending for our own liberty, we must be very cautious of violating the rights of conscience and others, ever considering that God alone is the judge of the hearts of men, and to, who, and to him only, in this case, are they answerable. He ordered that the Hessians who were captured be interned with German-speaking families in the area around Reading, Pennsylvania, writing this, if proper pains are taken to convince them how preferable the situation of their countrymen, the inhabitants of those counties, is to theirs, I think they may be sent back in the spring, so fraught with a love of liberty and property too, that they may create a disgust to the service and the remainder of the foreign troops and widen the breach that already has opened between them and the British. And in fact, things evolved exactly as Washington foresaw. By the end of the war, most of the Hessians became American citizens, and many of them volunteered to serve in the Continental Army. Now, George Washington was a stern disciplinarian, and he was very concerned that these rules be strictly enforced. He ordered, and I quote, should any American soldier be so base and infamous as to injure any prisoner, I do most earnestly enjoin you to bring him to such severe and exemplary punishment as the enormity of the crime may require. Should it extend to death itself, it will not prove disproportional to the guilt in such a time and in such a cause. And to his officers in conveying this, he said, fail not in heeding this order, for if you fail, you will bring shame, disgrace, and ruin to yourselves and to your country. Well, it's a shame that that order is no longer being followed. Washington's order fixed American military doctrine with respect to the treatment of detainees for about 230 years until 2002. Uh, that order, the series of orders that I read, were in fact codified by another minor American president, Abraham Lincoln. In General Orders Number 100 of 1863, Lincoln codified all the orders I just uh, gave and, and added another one in Article 16. Military necessity does not admit of cruelty, that is, the infliction of suffering uh, for the sake of suffering or for revenge, nor of maiming or wounding except in fight, nor of torture to extort confessions. <laughs> 
now in two thousand and two something changed now john you know is better than i what changed he knows a lot better than i the process of it but it's clear that the rules that were set out by washington lincoln and others were overturned and the warning that washington issued has come to pass for in fact our country has suffered shame and disgrace as a result of what has been done on october sixth the senate voted ninety to nine for an amendment which was explicitly crafted with the intention of overturning john use handiwork it was offered by john mccain and lindsey graham senator after senator went to the well of the senate and a great many of them made clear that in their minds they were not making new law they were declaring the law that has existed since before the founding of our republic and certainly since the battle of trenton and which this administration has capriciously set aside john mccain was a pow he was brutally tortured over a period of years in the hanoi hilton in the midst of his statement stands these lines. We are Americans. We hold ourselves to humane standards of treatment no matter how terribly evil or awful our adversaries may be. To do otherwise undermines our security and it also undermines our greatness as a nation. We are not simply any other nation. We stand for a lot more than that in the world, a moral mission one of freedom and democracy and human rights at home and abroad. Today, the Bush administration continues to threaten to veto this amendment. And the next two days, it will go into a conference committee where the Vice President Dick Cheney and Senator Stevens, on behalf of the GOP leadership and the Senate, uh, promise to, uh, to gut it. Um, Senator McCain has promised he will continue to press this legislation forward. Uh, because the measures, uh, it's now in the conference committee and three of the nine senators who voted in favor of torture and opposing this amendment uh, represent the Senate and the conference committee. So it's quite likely that uh, something uh, untoward will occur. If you believe like me that it is imperative that this measure uh, be passed and stand as law to clarify our commitment against torture, I ask you, write your senators and congressmen and express your unconditional support for the McCain Amendment. Thank you. Professor Yu? <clears throat> I have um, just a few points and um, First, I think this is the hardest question, and I don't think uh, Mr. Horton addressed it. Is, and this, unfortunately, it's not hypothetical. I wish this all were hypothetical. These are not the kinds of questions people go into the government to want to answer. But you're in the September, we've had the September 11th attacks, and the United States is fortunate to capture Abu Zubaydah, who's the number three leader in Al Qaeda. And he is in charge of all the operational plans for that organization to attack the United States. He has been trained to resist normal interrogation techniques. There's a manual, an al-Qaeda manual that we captured in previous operations that's been um, shown to Congress, I think it was waived in a hearing, about how to resist normal interrogation methods. So I ask you, does that mean that we are comfortable saying that our national leaders cannot do anything more than ask him simple questions to find out about pending attacks on the country? And he didn't answer that question, so I just want to put that to him uh, you know, his own rebuttal time because I'm maybe I'm trying to consume all of his rebuttal time answering my questions. Um, but I think that's an important question because I think you ought to have a real alternative to the policies. It's easy to criticize the administration's policies, but what would you actually do if you're in that situation? Would you really just follow the Geneva Convention even when you're not legally required to? And the reason for that is, and this goes to a substantive point, is that we are fighting a different kind of enemy. Yes, the George Washington example is a good one, and so is the Abraham Lincoln example. Although I might add that under the Union, those of you who follow the Civil War, the Union ran some very terrible prisoner of war camps, as did the Confederacy, notwithstanding Lincoln's orders. But anyway, those were wars with other nations, with other states, right? And I think there's a difference here, right? Abuse occurred in those conflicts because they were 
malicious examples of abuse for no per they were just they were senseless as was a senseless as senseless as what happened in Abu Ghraib but the point is when you're fighting a non-nation state right we don't have an enemy army to engage with on a battlefield there's no enemy territory population or cities to defeat or capture right the only way to stop an attack like September 11th is to get information that prevents that attack from occurring Right? And the only way to do that when you're fighting a non-nation state is to get intelligence information. And the best form of that information, unfortunately, is in the hands of operatives from Al-Qaeda. So how would you go about getting that information to stop future attacks? Would you really want to limit the United States to only being able to ask questions? Let me also make a point just in rebuttal about um, Iraq. I think it's quite clear that the Geneva Conventions apply in Iraq. I'm not here to argue that they don't. All of our political and military leaders said at the outset of the conflict that the Geneva Conventions applied to the conflict in Iraq and to Iraqi POWs captured. There have been many investigations that have been done or are still ongoing into why the uh, abuses at Abu Ghraib occurred. One thing I think is quite clear is that, that what you saw in Abu Ghraib and what um, was described in the letter are illegal under the Geneva Conventions, are illegal under current American military doctrine. The investigations so far have found no orders uh, ordering people to interrogate along the lines as what you saw in Abu Ghraib. And, and this is from a report done by uh, a Republican and Democrat former secretaries of defense. This conflict so far has witnessed a lower overall rate of abuse of prisoners than in any previous American conflict. So you're right. I mean, you could say there's, this is the practice if you point to a few cases, but the overall practice has not been systematically abusing prisoners. In fact, from what these commissions have so far found, that the rate of American force has been good. There will always be, in any conflict with large numbers of people, people who go beyond their orders or violate the rules. <coughs> and we should have investigations and proceedings to make sure those people investigated and punished. But that does not mean that the United States as a whole is conducting systematic abuse of, of prisoners in the Iraqi conflict. Just to give an analogy, you know, we have, uh, anyone who reads through uh, you know, the pro work product of the federal courts will see that there are levels of police abuse and abuse in prisons that occur in this country. Those are people who are violating the clear rules. That is not a, an example of a systematic conspiracy on the part of all the police agencies and prison authorities to conduct abuse. There's just simply cases where people will violate the rules and we have a system, a military justice system in place to investigate and punish those folks. The last thing I'll say uh, before I end is, uh, you know, what you've, fo what you've heard so far is a focus on the costs of American policy. And I'm not denying that we live in a world where American policy doesn't have costs in terms of foreign policy, in terms of prestige, and so on. But you haven't heard much discussion of are the benefits, right? Because those benefits are secret. Right? It may be the case that a coercive interrogation at Guantanamo Bay has contributed to the fact that there have been no terrorist attacks in the last four years, has contributed to the fact the United States has successfully killed or captured two-thirds of the al-Qaeda leadership. Right? Now, if that may be true, may not be true. It's hard to know because all that information would be classified. But I think in order to properly judge what the policy ought to be, one ought to have a sense of both the benefits and the costs. And I'm afraid I don't have um, the certainty that Mr. Horton does about what the proper policy is such that I want to prohibit all forms of interrogation that go beyond the Geneva Convention standards. Thank you very much. Mr. Horton? Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me say, first of all, I don't agree that, uh, that we're faced with a dichotomy of choosing between criminal justice process and application of the laws of armed conflict. And by the way, those are the rules. The Geneva Conventions are one small part of the total set of rules governing conflict. I think actually both of them clearly apply in different circumstances. And I do not oppose the, I the idea of, a p of a p application of law of armed conflict to conflicts, which you know, would certainly encompass both uh, the, uh, the military missions in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. The next point, um, uh, John says uh, that if the Geneva Conventions apply, there can be no coercive interrogation of someone who is held as a detainee. That's just wrong, just wrong. Uh, that's based on an assumption that the only protected category under the Geneva Conventions uh, are prisoners of war. And in fact, that is 
A category, and that, that category is subject to a very high level of protection under the conventions. Uh, and I certainly uh, agree uh, with John Yu uh, that, uh, in fact, Al-Qaeda are not entitled to prisoner of war uh, status, assuming that is your position, but I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the protections that are available to them under the Geneva Conventions are the baseline protections of common uh, Article 3, uh, which provide for humanitarian treatment. Uh, and unlike uh, Al Gonzalez and John Yu, I think there is a very great literature, including within the Geneva Conventions, that tells you uh, what that, uh, what that uh, protection is. Uh, but it does not rule out uh, all forms of uh, coercive interrogation. It precludes torture, cruel and human and degrading treatment, uh, and those are the same uh, prohibitions uh, that Senators McCain and Graham are uh, building into the law uh, with their amendments. Now, John also says that there are no orders uh, showing uh, that um, uh, abusive uh, interrogation uh, practices could be used in Iraq, uh, and he says it was clear from the outset uh, that Iraq was covered uh, by the Geneva Conventions. It's a proposition of law, he's absolutely right. Uh, no reasonable person could dispute but that the Geneva Conventions applied to the conflict uh, in Iraq. However, the administration presented its position speaking very forcefully and saying that the Geneva Conventions did not apply to the global war on terror, saying that the Iraq conflict was the centerpiece of the global war on terror, and the message that went to our troops was loud and clear uh, and led, uh, and led uh, on that level and others to the abuse. The statement that there are no orders authorizing uh, these abusive interrogation techniques is false. If you look at the Faye Jones report, you will see it records a series of three orders that were issued by Lieutenant General Sanchez, the first of them within 48 hours of the departure of Jeffrey Miller, who was sent by Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld to Gitmoize the situation. These orders reflected introduction of Guantanamo-approved interrogation techniques that were devised in conscious circumvention of the standards of the Geneva Convention. So, John, I just recommend you go in and actually read those reports. Now, Secretary Schlesinger, who as far as I know is a Republican, uh, was responsible for a report, uh, and that report, I think, does a pretty competent job of, of collecting underlying data that was done by other reports, particularly the Faye Jones report. Now, it does not reflect what Secretary Schlesinger said in a number of talk show interviews in the weeks thereafter, namely that uh, the abuses that occurred were the results of Animal House on the night shift beyond the control or the authority uh, of a command authority. Now, we know subsequently a, an internal investigation was done by Lieutenant General Mark uh, Randall Schmidt of abuses at Guantanamo Bay. And in the Schmidt report, or the part of it that we have now seen that has been released, we see listed over and over again, in fact, graphically, a series of practices <coughs> that included the exact same practices that we saw at Abu Ghraib, and that included use of military dogs, use of sexual humiliation techniques, um, use of, uh, of, uh, of uh, women's underwear, stress positions. He lists these tactics, and then at the end of the column, he says, no prosecution or disciplinary action recommended because this reflects a formally approved procedure. And I think that completely exploded the fallacious characterization uh, that Secretary Schlesinger uh, put forward. But I'll give you another Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, uh, and Melvin Laird uh, is quoted in Sunday in the Washington Post, uh, having looked at recent reports and saying it reminded him of what the North Vietnamese did in the Hanoi Hilton. He says it isn't as severe as the Hanoi Hilton, but it was just as sickening and clearly going on a road of moral abandonment. And I'll cite you another fine Republican office holder uh, former United States Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, General Colin Powell. On October 6th, I was in Washington support working with a number of retired military officers uh, in support of the McCain Amendment, 
and we were joined by secretary of state powell and he spoke with a number of congressman and among the remarks he put forward were the question of the fruits of these tactics he said he had never been so humiliated in his entire life as he was delivering a presentation in the security council supporting the war with iraq where item after item of intelligence that he was forced to rely upon, or rely upon was extracted using torture of the detainees from Guantanamo. All of it proved false. And that shows you the utility of these techniques. Humiliation, embarrassment, shame, destruction of our nation's reputation. Thank you very much. What we're going to do now... we'll do now is we're going to turn the floor over to you. Um, we have about 35 minutes for questions. Um, what I'd like you to do is simply get my attention as you, if you ask your question, there's a couple of things I'd like you to keep in mind. First, I'd like you to be able to identify yourself. And two, I'd like to remind you that uh, you're asking questions. Uh, you're not one of the two debaters up here. People have come here to listen to their answer. So if it appears that you're making a statement from your own personal bully pulpit, I'll take the opportunity to interrupt you. <laughs> so, questions? Gentleman in front. Dale Eichelman, uh, I teach anthropology here. I work on the Middle East. Two questions, or two related things, Professor Yu. If I understand your main point right, it's you know, a very interesting forensic point. Do we want to take certain options off the table in a war on terror by removing coercive force? And related to that, the argument that, that we really don't know the benefits. We know what's gone wrong. We don't know what the benefits are. Therefore, and here I'm adding my own editorial thing. Sorry, Alan. Um, trust us. Uh, there might be some. But yet, from what we know about interrogation in the past, domestically, for instance, from Fred Inbow, when one stopped using the third degree and tried using other methods, uh, perhaps now overseen by Miranda, uh, police officers liked it because they got better results than by like, simply beating people or uh, using some of the methods that were considered not to work. And one of the, this I can't document terribly well, but some people involved in interrogation <coughs> in the early stages were passing around a book by one Han Schaff, a Nazi interrogator of the Air Force, uh, who was later brought over by U.S. Air Force veterans groups because they regarded him as the best damn interrogator they ever had, and he never used force. He used real intelligence rather than just humiliation and the other things that Mr. Horton used, and he got much better results. And so the question that I would have to you is, can you do a little better than say, trust, uh, here I'm not talking about the theory. The moral argument has been put very well by Mr. Horton, and at the very end, Mr. Horton also said, we're not sure these methods work. Can you do a little better? to suggest to us that coercive interrogation might work better for us than, for instance, it's done for the Israelis. In 1982, or when, when the Israelis invaded southern Lebanon, they were welcomed, and the film reports show people cheering them. Uh, later, because of some of the methods used, uh, uh, this was the real catalyst to get this film really going and give it real popular support. So can you give us a better argument for the benefits that we've seen today by coercive interrogation outside of the various uh, the various limits that we've managed to work with up to this point? Well, um, first, I'm not making a trust us argument in the sense that um, you know the way our intelligence laws work, all this information has to be disclosed to the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees, and they perform an oversight role. Now, they they don't reveal it publicly, but they do. Uh, take it in and they can make changes or alterations to the laws if they feel they're not working properly and they take in information about the policies are working and they have the power to cut funding you know if they want to close Guantanamo Bay they could close it tomorrow just by cutting off funding for Guantanamo Bay so I I think there's a difficulty and, and the reason is difficult and this is a great contrast to the criminal justice system is because uh, we are fighting a war that's going on right now um, unlike crime where the effects of releasing information publicly in an open trial don't have future harms on the country. The problem with the war on terrorism is that 
there are direct impacts from the release of public information our ability to succeed so to give an example um, during the trial of the first the bombers of the first world trade center um, the United States did want to show in, in court how we knew that Osama bin Laden had given orders to the operatives who'd been captured, and the White House, for I, I think for I think there's a mistake, but the White House decided to release the fact that we had the ability to intercept and surveil Osama bin Laden's personal cell phone, and within 48 hours he stopped using cell phones and never used them since. That's a great example of how releasing information right now can have immediate impact on our ability to stop future attacks. Because if we had continued to have that ability, who knows what we've been able to stop. So that's the reason why I can't, I don't think the administration can release the kind of precise data you're looking for. I do think, however, um, that you make a good point. We, there are ways we could look at the experience of other countries. I mean, Israel is a very good example. They um, have used coercive interrogation in the past. In fact, the Israeli courts said that there are policies that you can use which are not torture but which are coercive. And they, you know, there have been several, I think two, at least two commissions now that have reviewed the effectiveness of this interrog of interrogation this way. And the last one that I saw said that coercive interrogation has led to the prevention of suicide bombing in Israel. Now, the, the, the question we have to decide is at what rate, right? I mean, if you really want to get into the cost-benefit analysis of it, you'd want to know what rate does it actually stop these attacks and whatever, and, and balance that against the cost? In some ways, I take uh, Mr. Horton to, to be uh, not even wanting to make a utilitarian argument or calculus, that um, he's making an ar a Kantian argument that's just, this is wrong to do this always and forever, and we should have a complete ban on it, regardless of what the benefits are. And I, I, you know, I, I can see that's a, a morally attractive position to take, it's a, but I don't think it grapples with the real hard life, hard real life questions about what you do when you capture some of these people who have been trained to resist the kind of interrogation techniques techniques that maybe have been proven successful with normal POWs. I, I, I'm sorry if that's not a satisfying answer, but that's the best I can do. Mr. Roy? If I, even though it wasn't directed to me, if I can give just a, a brief uh, addition to my Kantian position on this. Um, uh, I think we have a crisis in military intelligence gathering right now. I think that's, that's absolutely clear. I think the use of highly coercive interrogation <laughs> techniques has exacerbated the crisis. But the core of the crisis lies in the quality of our intelligence gathering effort. Uh, and I'll just give you a simple example, which I got from speaking with an MI colonel just a few weeks ago. If we go back and look at the, at the last stage of the Cold War, up until the time of the first Gulf War, who were the interrogators and how were they handling things? They were young officers. They had a college education. Most of them had advanced training. They were able to conduct interrogation and the language of the person who was being interrogated. Beyond that, they had a sophisticated understanding of the culture of that individual. They were able to operate effectively. If we look at our current situation, if you look at some of the studies that have been done about uh, interrogation at Guantanamo, for instance, who are the interrogators? NCOs, weekend soldiers, people who may have a high school equivalency degree, who have almost certainly not been to college, who have a bare mastery of the English language, but not a foreign language. This is unacceptable. It's catastrophic, and it's what's contrib contributing to our current dilemma. We have not made the investment uh, in human uh, capacity that we need to make. John Yu uh, is a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. One of his colleagues there, uh, Mark uh, Gorek, has written about this, I think, very compellingly, and that is the crux of our current intelligence crisis. May I just make one? Oh, I just yeah, we'll, we'll follow on. We'll have a chance to I just wondered, get in. I, I just realized I had something else to say in response to this. OK, far away. <laughs> Which is, I, I, the president did make an announcement that there were 10 terrorist attacks. Your oh, you can't hear me? Sorry. That there were 10 um, terrorist attacks have been stopped. Um, and just two of them, one was Jose Padilla. Another one was another, uh, uh, another person who was not a citizen in the country who had been planning to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge. And, you know, I guess without 
disclosing classified information, how do you think the government found out about that? I mean, I think it's got to be coming from either interrogation or electronic intercepts of information. And so there, I think the question is, I think the way the government has to think about it is, you can get this information, it prevents attacks, and you have to ask, is it worth it given how many lives you're, sa you're saving? And given what we saw on September 11th, potentially you're saving a lot of lives. Um, I had a question for... Please identify yourself. Oh, sorry. Nathan Hamilton, uh, senior. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Horton. Um, you were talking about the, the policies that were set in place by George Washington that were in existence about uh, 2002 and then you described the, the overhaul of those policies. I, I believe it's like a, a moral a moral tragedy and a shame. Um, but obviously, in history, um, American soldiers, you know, have have committed you know brutality uh, towards towards other. I'm thinking, you know, in the in the Pacific in World War II, um, the American forces and the Japanese forces were just incredibly brutal towards each other. I mean, going going way beyond. Uh, Anything that has ever been done, I would, I would think almost. And um, and uh, as to my knowledge, those those acts were you know they were known about uh, not necessarily in the American public, but were known about in the military and were accepted and uh, were never uh, investigated or 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 even fought. Um, unlike today, uh, where you see you see. You know, investigations into Abu Ghraib and people being brought to trial and stuff like that. So, I guess, do you think those those sorts of atrocities, um, you know, that American soldiers have committed, do you think those were, um, you know, hugely damaging to our to our um, moral character as a nation? Do you think those circumstances are different, or what is what is your opinion? Well, let me say, first of all, there, uh, we're talking about people who've been taken out of combat and they're being held prison, uh, prisoners of war or prisoners in detention centers. Now, that's a very different situation legally and ethically from what happens on the field of battle. And we understand all sorts of abusive things happen all the time on the field of battle. Horrible things happen to prisoners, too. I wish this were the first time America has uh, had a, a torture scandal. It's not. Um, I, I talked about the Revolutionary War and what happened there. I mean, it was a big issue in the Revolutionary War. Uh, if you look at the uh, Spanish-American War, again, American newspapers were filled with accounts of torture that was visited upon Filipinos in particular. There were a whole series of high-profile trials that occurred. Andersonville, which Professor Yu, I think, was alluding to, uh, at the end of the Civil War. I mean, another case of horrible abuse. Uh, I'm not saying that there haven't been abuses. Of course there have. You know, that's a part of the human condition, and it's a part of war. I'm saying the policy of the United States, the military policy of the United States, has been clear throughout this period and has provided guidance against this. Not that it's a guarantee that it won't happen, and yes, after the Spanish-American War, there were prosecutions that resulted in convictions, and there have been at other times, too. Uh, so what's happened, what happened in 2002 was that that policy, that guidance was dispensed with. And what Captain Fishback and Senator McCain and Senator Graham have been complaining about is the absence of the affirmative policy and guidance to soldiers in the field addressing this area. Is what the, the best case you can make for the administration is that they created a field of unacceptable ambiguity with respect to conduct. I think it's a lot worse than that, actually. But the best case is ambiguity. And soldiers who are fighting out in the field deserve to have clear guidance. And they had that. They had that in Field Manual 3452. John McCain, to his great credit, has said, reinstate that manual, okay? I mean, we know there are efforts within this administration which put this field manual out of force to generate a new one. The general who was responsible for doing that raised some questions about it and wound up being dismissed after allegations that he was having improper sexual relations. In the fourth row back, 
So, so far we've been talking about people who are, you know, marked and assume they know something. But presumably if we're thinking, you know, thousands or so detainees, at least some of them are not going to be, they're not going to know anything, they're not going to be guilty. So my question to you is, is sort of twofold. It's when have we had, when do we say enough is enough, they don't know anything, they're not guilty, they, they haven't done anything, and release them, and how far can we go? What is sort of the qualitative guidelines for how much can we do to these guys to find that out? Well, I, I, I guess there's two uh, different populations of people you're talking about. One would be um, people are just completely unrelated to al-Qaeda, or we're not fighting at all. So an example would be uh, someone who'd be captured in Afghanistan, for example, who was, was just a pure civilian and just got caught up uh, by mistake. Um, those, those folks, you know, it's not legal for the United States to detain them. And so the United States should release them after, con you know, conducts, uh, it assures itself that these folks are not, you know, who they say they are, or I mean, are who they say they are. And there's a process, there's a tribunal process that's been set up um, that exists that's you know, consistent with what the Geneva Convention requires, which is not a legal process, it's just a, a process that requires basically three officers to hear evidence about whether this person is in fact uh, a civilian or is, uh, is an enemy combatant. But I think you know, that one thing I'd say is the United States doesn't have an interest in spending whatever it is, forty or $50,000 a year to detain people who are not members of Al-Qaeda. It's just a waste of time and money and resources. Um, so I think they have every interest in finding out exactly who's who and releasing the people. We're not, now let me also say that the United States has released quite a number of people from Guantanamo Bay, so, you know, and, and some of them have been captured fighting again in Afghanistan. So the United States has released people and it's made mistakes in releasing some of those people. Um, now when it comes to Al-Qaeda, I think the, the second part of your question is about how long can you just hold people for who are members of Al-Qaeda, who are enemy combatants, um, you know, how long, you know, how, what kind of evidence do we need to satisfy ourselves that they are member versus, members of Al-Qaeda? Now, under the laws of war, um, you can detain someone until the conflict is over. It's not, there's no criminal trial, um, and there's no criminal sentence. Now, it may be, it, it, I think it is a very difficult legal question, or a difficult question generally to figure out when the war with Al-Qaeda is actually over. Um, and I think, I don't think we're at that point yet. I think we can get at that point. But I think we have to figure out just sort of definitionally when that's going to occur. And when that occurs, they can be released. But under the way war has been fought, uh, historically and under the rules of war now, whether the Geneva Convention or not apply, um, you can hold those folks until the conflict ends, until hostilities end. And that may be a long time from now. I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the chair here for just a moment and ask a follow-up question for Mr. Yu. Um, this comes out of a question that uh, Senator Leahy asked Justice Roberts in the Senate, uh, the um, Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Patrick Leahy asked Judge Roberts, who gets to decide when the war is over? The Constitution is, in fact, rather vague on that. Mm -hmm. um, it's very clear that Congress has the power to declare war. Congress has the theoretical ability to exercise the power of the purse, as you alluded to. In some wars, the American people have decided the war's over. We're pulling the plug on your administration. Um, is that where we should look for a decision about when this otherwise potentially endless war will arise? Well, one, one, uh, that's a very good question, but uh, you're a ringer, so. <laughs> Being a professor and all, you're already, you already know all the questions. Oh, you were going to ask it? You made him promise to ask it? Well, you should have. Oh, okay. Well, good. <laughs> You're not in his class, are you? <laughs> you must be an alum. <laughs> um, or at least, uh, well, never mind. Um, let me, uh, uh, this is actually, this, the Supreme Court has addressed this question, actually, who gets to decide when a war is over. So with World War II, hostilities ended in 1945. The United States continued to detain uh, members of the enemy in prisoner of war camps through till 1950 and beyond. And some of those folks brought suit and said, the war is over, let us go. 
Um, and the Supreme Court actually, in a, it's a case called Ludica versus Watkins, said it's up to the political branches, the president and Congress to decide. The courts aren't going to get in the job of deciding when the conflict is over. And then as between the two, I think either of the branches could decide it was over. I mean, if the Congress terminates all funding and issues a state, you know, they can easily take the steps, terminate funding, demobilize the military, repeal the Patriot Act. There's a number of things it could do to stop the war. In fact, it doesn't have to do anything. It just has to not fund anything. It's, a, it's actually interesting. It would have to, it has to act every year to keep the war going on. If it just sat on its hands and did nothing, the war would effectively end because we wouldn't have the resources to carry it out. And the president certainly can unilaterally declare the war over. That's how basically World War II ends in, uh, in the early 50s. Um, so I, I think that answers, uh, I think that answers pretty straightforward. It doesn't get us to the harder problem of when sh they should exercise that power given that um, we're not fighting, this is another problem of the fighting a non-nation state. You cannot sign a peace treaty with them, um, even if we could. You know, Osama bin Laden and his leadership are probably not gonna be able to convince the other members of Al-Qaeda to stop fighting. So I think we have, and peace treaties are the traditional way we recognize conflicts to be over, so we have to think of a, an equivalent, essentially, to a peace treaty, which would allow us to at least identify when the conflict is over, and we should demobilize and end wartime measures. Uh, Mr. Horton, I, I, I could just uh, say I think there's some very important issues as to the definition of war, what constitutes a war for purposes of international law, particularly including the Geneva Conventions. Uh, there was a war in Afghanistan, that's clear. There is a war in Iraq. Now, the global war on terror, is that a war? Is that a war? Maybe it's a war like the war on war against poverty is a war. But it's not a war within the contemplation of international law. And I don't think attempting to measure it uh, and uh, set limits the way John Yu does is something that's particularly sensible, nor a view that really carries a lot of weight uh, in the international legal scholarship. If we look at the war in Iraq, we see an end to our occupation period having been determined uh, on June 28, 2004. If we look at the war in Afghanistan, we see the Afghan government having taken uh, custody of most of the prisoners who were captured there as in the process of releasing them. In fact, most of them have been released. Uh, and I think it makes much more sense to evaluate this war in terms of those two conflicts. Rather than to accept the notion of a war which has no limits in time and in space, uh, which, uh, which I think is uh, the fundamental problem with this war on terror. Terror is a technique, and how can you wage war on a technique? Let me just make a point about that. If he's right, then the September 11th attacks were not an act of war, right? They're just a gigantic criminal problem. And if he's right, it is illegal to launch a preemptive attack on Osama bin Laden if we were to find his location, right? Because if this is not a war, we're not allowed to use military tactics against people other than the armed forces of Afghanistan and Iraq. And, I, and let me just also make clear, I'm not arguing that the, we're waging war on everyone who uh, uses terrorism tactics. I mean, terrorism is a tactic, just like kamikaze flights are a tactic. We are at war, I think, with a distinct entity, which is the Al-Qaeda terrorist organization. Uh, Could you identify yourself? foe 
spelled it in here, humanitarian principles. This is sort of research of our uh, moderator. Um, because it discourages surrender rate. And uh, so Iranian soldiers don't, may not like Iraqi soldiers very much, but they like the United States soldiers even less for pouring chemicals on the face. Cuba knows about uh, the cell blocks in Guantanamo Bay. It seems like once these um, policies are sort of adopted and inculcated, they become cultured and it could be a really self uh, I, I know about those studies, and you're quite right. There are studies about whether um, policies have an effect on surrender rates. Those are all done with nation states, and the question is whether that applies and works with members of Al Qaeda, who uh, are suicide bombers often, who don't even. Who, why would they care whether we have humanitarian policies in the capture and detention? when they want to kill themselves, right? That's what we saw on September 11th. So. I, I'm not saying that the surrender rate data is incorrect. I'm just saying that right, it's not a measure of what works vis-a-vis -a, -vis a non-state terrorist organization, particularly one that's. It can be a, like a normal charge operation. It, it was I know. Hold, hold on. It was not, not worth the I, I understand there's two parts to the question, so I'm, I'm going to get to the second part. Don't worry. But I'm just saying the first part, though, I think it's an important empirical and factual question whether that data actually would apply with a non-state organization. I, it's just the, I don't think anyone purports that they do, right? One way or the other, I think it would be, a, you know, a leap of, you know, be a bit of a leap to say that they naturally would apply with Al Qaeda, for example. Um, the second question about culture, um, I think that's a hard question, right? Uh, I, you know, one one could make the argument, well, this these techniques are going to seep into military culture and they'll be used everywhere. You could also make the argument that the it's clear for the United States to apply certain rules when there's a Geneva Convention conflict and when there and a different set of rules when there's a non-Geneva Convention conflict. It needs to be clear in training people what those are. And the thing, I mean, you know, yes, there's a policy change in 2002, but I think what really happened that change was in 2001 when we were attacked by a different kind of enemy. And I think it's expecting too much for the military to have instant perfection in the policies they're going to pursue in reaction to an attack that no one anticipated and had not been thought about. And so, yes, I think the United States is in the process of trying to make clear, even clearer, that one set of rules apply with Al Qaeda and war with Al Qaeda, and another set of rules would apply and continue to apply with the Geneva Conventions as to Iran, which is a signatory. I mean, I, I think. All the countries you listed actually are signatories to the Geneva Conventions. There may come a time, there may be a case when there is a conflict with a non-Geneva Convention signatory, and the Geneva Conventions would not apply. There'd be other rule, there are other rules. It's quite right that there are um, customary rules of international law that govern warfare, and those would come into effect. Uh, one thing I would say about uh, terrorism, however, is that customary international law and custom and tradition change and have to be adapted to new circumstances. And I think if there was ever an example of that, it would be September 11th, where customary rules of warfare were primarily developed for wars between nation states, as you describe. And I think those would continue to apply without change. But what we have to do, and I think what we're in the process of doing, is adapting that body of law and body of rules to something we've never faced before. And so, yes, there have been problems, but I don't think that means the whole enterprise is somehow uh, Ought not to be pursued. Mr. Horton? It, I think your hypothetical is not very hypothetical, frankly. Laura Scapetta, Carolyn Woods, Barbara Fast, three people associated with serious abuse at Guantanamo and in Abu Ghraib. And where are they today? They are teaching interrogation techniques at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. So this is happening right now. Um, in April, about a year ago, uh, John, you and I uh, appeared on uh, uh, the News Hour with uh, Jim Lehrer, and I, I remember the next morning I got a visit from Harold Tyler, who was my mentor, who uh, ran the Justice Department uh, in the Ford administration, uh, and he stopped by and uh, talked about, uh, he said he had watched the program, he said, it's very good you're talking about the Geneva Conventions, keep at it. He said, I'm appalled at what's going on in this Justice Department. I can't believe an institution I associated so much of my life with is doing the shameful, disgraceful things that are happening today. And he told me something else. 
I was a prisoner of war. I was taken prisoner in Germany in the last days of the Second World War, and I thought if it hadn't have been for our practices of properly treating prisoners of war and for the Geneva Conventions, I wouldn't be alive today. I'd be dead. Now, he died two months ago, and I went to his funeral and met there one of his army comrades, uh, who, and I relayed the story to him, uh, and he told me, well, you know, with typical modest, modesty, Judge Tyler did not tell you the entire story. He told you he was taken prisoner. He didn't tell you that the next day he convinced the entire German company that had captured him to become his prisoners of war, and he marched them back to the headquarters. <laughs> now, that is one of the positive sides of American policy. If you remember the first Gulf War, you remember the scenes of thousands of Iraqi soldiers giving up at the end of the war. If you remember this war, the same thing occurred. Now, with the legacy of Abu Ghraib and the rest of uh, these uh, humiliating and disgraceful images behind us, can you imagine in the next war in the Middle East that we're gonna see the same phenomenon of thousands of soldiers surrendering, expecting that they will be treated humanely? I don't think so. And what is this going to translate into and in lost lives for Americans? Um, this is to Professor Yu. Could you identify yourself, please? Oh, my name is Lucy Young, and I'm a member of the community. Um, not a Dartmouth affiliated person. Um, you base most of your argument on the fact that you consider this a war and a war against Al Qaeda. But the war is being held in Iraq, not anywhere else. And my understanding is that the people who attacked the World Trade Towers were 19 out of 20 were Saudi Arabians. They were not Iraqis. So on what basis do you say that us fighting in the country of Iraq and against and now against the Iraqi people who are using the only means they've got against the American invaders, how do you, can you describe this as a war against terror rather than a war against Iraq? Well, I mean, we are at war against, uh, we were at war against Iraq. Um, and I think the Geneva Conventions apply to that conflict, but I don't think it's true that the war on terrorism is not occurring anywhere but Iraq. I mean, I think the United States is, um, pursuing military action against members of al-Qaeda in many other different locations, from you know, parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan to the Philippines to Yemen and Sudan, and not just Iraq. So I think there is much more than just the conflict in Iraq. The second, I want to make clear, you know, I think the war on terrorism is um, a rhetorical tool that the you know, administration uses to you know, generate popular support and mobilization. I think legally there's a difference. I don't think legally we're at war with terrorism. I think we're at war with Al-Qaeda. But what's different, and that's the fact that it's a non-nation state, it's people hide and travel all over the world. There is no territory which we know that they are located in that we can take over and conquer and, and win. But I don't think, I do think that the war goes well, be, uh, well the war with Al-Qaeda is distinct from the war with Iraq, goes well beyond the uh, borders of Iraq. I think uh, it's true that a claim is made in the Schlesinger report that the numbers uh, of abuse are uh, historically low compared with other conflicts. I don't believe that. Uh, and these statistics are being generated by the Department of Defense in order to support a contention. I can give you an example of how they get there. When Major General Fay, who conducted uh, the examination of military intelligence units, 
spoke to them, spoke to, uh, to soldiers in, uh, in both in Iraq and in Germany, he would gather groups and he would say to them, if any of you witnessed abuse of a detainee and you failed to report it at the time, you're going to be brought up on charges. Now, did any of you witness abuse of detainees? And one of, I'm not joking. This is exactly what happened. Uh, so they consciously conducted the examination in a way designed to minimize the number of claims so that they could report this is a matter of dozens. But in fact, the total number of claims already is into the hundreds, many, many hundreds. Uh, and if investigations were conducted fairly, we would find that there are systemic practices going on here that are producing these abuses. So I think the, the appropriate uh, focus here, it's not on a couple of rotten apples, it's on the policies. What are the policies of the government? Does the government have policies that say do not abuse detainees? Or does it have policies that say just the opposite? The U.S. may benefit and, and we have benefited from the course of interrogation techniques, although these benefits are um, not public knowledge. Knowing many of these detainees have extensive training in resisting various interrogation techniques, um, Mr. Horton, do you think this possible beneficial information obtained in the course of interrogation techniques could be obtained with the same success using a different interrogation approach, or do we just sacrifice that knowledge and may only um, game with course of interrogation techniques in return for um, following uh, moral or um, humane interrogation. Well, I, I think um, I, I, I think uh, you know Secretary um, uh, Powell, you know, gives very good testimony to a key point here, and that is when highly coercive techniques are used, detainees don't tell the truth. They say what they think the interrogator wants to hear. So it's, you know, methodologically highly flawed. You know, we want good intelligence. In fact, better than that, we would like to turn people as sources. That's the way you get really good long-term <laughs> intelligence. And highly coercive techniques are never effective to do that. They simply uh, don't work. So I think these are not efficient techniques. I think the techniques the U U.S. has developed and used over generations are good, are valid, and that we simply need to make the investment in human resources to use them properly. That's, that's the good start. But I'll go beyond that and say we have another interest here. John Yu uh, is constantly suggesting that somehow it's foolish or um, or a waste of resources to use the criminal justice system. Well, actually, I've been at several meetings with, uh, with uh, uh, survivors of the 9-11 catastrophe, and I'll tell you one thing I hear from them over and over again is, why are there no prosecutions of the people who are involved here? We want to see them brought before a court, tried, and convicted. We want proof of what happened, and we want people to be punished for these crimes. That is an absolutely appropriate goal for us. And torture frustrates that as a goal. Because, you know, evidence that's gathered from a highly coercive interrogation, from torture in particular, is not going to be admissible in any serious legal system. And moreover, once you do it, you've probably tainted the entire process, making it very, very difficult to bring an effective prosecution. So I criticize this administration not only for introducing torture, but also for failure to prosecute criminals and bring them to justice. It needs to do that. And it's waited too many years before starting the process. I also believe a military commission's approach is appropriate. That's time honored and tested. I don't believe the military commission's approach that's been put forward by this administration is a correct one. They should be using our court-martial process. And all the deviations they've introduced from that process are undermining, uh, are undermining it, 
and making it less likely that the world will accept its results. Thank you. Professor Yu, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, first I think we should um, not look just at rhetoric but on the facts. And the facts are that in certain situations, coercive interrogation does work. And that's the information we have from Israel. It's not perfect, but it has led in Israel to the prevention of suicide bombers. So I think it's just untrue to say it never works at all. The second thing is, yeah, you could use a criminal justice system to respond to terrorism, right? Where are you gonna get the defendants for the 9-11 attacks? They're all dead. And the point is, yes, the criminal justice system does serve purposes in terms of making people uh, you know, soothing people's guilt and punishing people. How does it work when people are dead that carried out the attacks? The second thing I'd say about using the criminal justice system is it doesn't prevent the attacks in the first place, right? We could have a trial of people connected with the 9-11 attacks. That's not gonna help. In fact, it could undermine our ability to stop the next 9-11 attack. And that is a difference in outlook between us because I think if you want to engage in a retrospective exercise that's designed to assign guilt or blame after the attack has occurred, then a criminal justice system makes sense. If you want to prevent future attacks, I do not think that's the right model to go forward with, and I don't think people generally think it does. Using a criminal justice system was what we tried up and through the entire 90s and the 80s, and it did not stop a 9-11 style attack, and I don't see how it would stop any future 9-11 attacks. I think we have time for one more question. We'll go with the uh, gentleman in the red there in the front row. Yes, thank you. I'm uh, a former employee of the Sport Authority. I'm retired and I uh, worked at the World Trade Center. And I was involved uh, pretty directly with the efforts to get the people who were trapped in the center just by passing information. So I really am quite sensitive to Professor Yu's views of, the, uh, of that uh, terrible accident, terrible attack as a way of uh, saying that this country should therefore be immoral and be uh, gung-ho on whenever we get a, uh, a suspect to grill it. And I would ask him to consider who might those suspects have been before 9-11. Those suspects before 9-11 were pretty well known because of the 1993 attack. And we had, I believe his name was Abu Ramzi, I'm not sure. But uh, he was uh, uh, available for information gathering at all times. Uh, but there was no coterie of suspects that we could have found. I'm just not sure that uh, by virtue of having the ability to be inhumane to uh, uh, people, to uh, suspects, that we would have gotten anywhere before 9-11 because those suspects weren't uh, around there. We had eight years to get information. So I think this is just a misappropriation, which this uh, administration has done in spades, of the tragedy that happened at the World Trade Center to gin up this country to go off into a completely different direction. And I think that it is immoral. Let me, let me say this. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that we have people in our custody now who might have information about future terrorist attacks. Putting aside what happened pre-9-11, we do have in custody, right, the three, four, and f number three, four, and five people who are, in, the people who are in charge and plan the 9-11 attacks themselves are in our custody. Right, I, so I don't think it's a case where there's no one who we have now but to question. I think you're drawing the wrong, the wrong conclusion. To me, the conclusion was that there's gross incompetence no, for the no, United States no. not to have been aware. No, I'm not saying. No, I'm not saying it's gross incompetence. I, I, I don't mean to say anything like that. All I'm saying is that we had a mindset that was shared by everybody that we would use a criminal justice system to handle terrorism. And I, I'm not saying it was unreasonable. I'm not saying that people were incompetent. I, mean, I think, you know, look, you, I mean, people on 9-11 performed heroic acts. So don't, don't read me as saying anything like that. And, okay, and let me let's see why. But that doesn't mean that we ought to continue following the same policies that we did before 9-11, right? I mean, I think right now we do have in our custody leaders of al-Qaeda, people who are in charge of the 9-11 attacks and the attacks since. And the question is whether we should interrogate them more vigorously than we did. And I think the failure you're thinking of is a guy named Ramzi Youssef, I think is his name, who was connected with the first World Trade Center bombing. And he is handled through the criminal justice system. And we did not use any coercive interrogation techniques with him. And we got nothing from him. And so the point is, 
I'm not saying anybody did anything wrong pre-9-11. The only question is 9-11 changed, it seems to me, changed the world and the kind of threats we have to face. And the question is, shouldn't we change our policies to adapt to that new circumstance? But I'm not trying to place any kind of guilt or blame or charges of incompetence. I'm not making any ad hominem attacks here on anybody. So I would uh, please be clear about that. Well, suppose, well, I, I don't want to get a long, you know, tip by tack debate with you, but suppose we had decided that terrorism, that the attacks on the uh, embassies, the attacks on the coal did start a war between us and Al Qaeda, and we had attacked Afghanistan earlier, and we captured these people before 9 11, and we had interrogated them more toughly. I, I'm not saying that, I just don't think it was really in the realm of the way people thought pre 9 11 to do any of those things, but you could always play a counterfactual historical game and say, well, maybe we could have done those things and things might have very well turned out that we could have stopped 9-11. But I don't know, that's just guessing. Thank you. And thank you. Thank all of you for coming today.